Good morning. I'm uh, Brigadier General Retired Mike Fleming. I'm the Outreach Director for the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Centerstone. Thank you so much for being uh, here in our Jacksonville Clinic, in our community room, and also in uh, online. Uh, we sure appreciate uh, all of your assistance, all of your help, and uh, thank you for faith leaders. What we, uh, we designed this because we really felt like faith leaders were an important element of the, uh, for veterans and military families, because most veterans don't go to active duty installations to be a, uh, to get their, uh, go to attend their faith uh, house of worship. They turn to you here in this room and also you online. And so we've created some things. We've created some uh, resources for you and we'll go through that, but we'll, we're gonna break it into a couple of different things. First, we're gonna have the four sponsoring organizations, which is the Veterans Administration, the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Centerstone, uh, Operation New Uniform, and then the Firewatch are all resources that you as faith leaders should know about and can really be instrumental in helping the uh, veterans and military families that you serve. Uh, additionally, we'll have, uh, we'll break it up from there. Uh, Chaplain Wester and I will be having a uh, briefings to you. I'm gonna start off and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the military experience because we feel like that's very important to talk about the military experience. And then Chaplain Wester, uh, obviously a man of faith and then just like you works directly with people and he's gonna to talk to you about maybe how to work with military clients. And we feel like that combination plus the resources that we wanna give you will help you. And uh, you'll see the, some of the challenges at the end, but the, one of the main things is obviously use this with the men and women in the military families that you have, but also become advocates for this type of training because the more we have, the better. Uh, as we are uh, you know, all people of faith, uh, Chaplain Melvin Lane is the VA chaplain down in Gainesville. He was instrumental last year when we had one of these uh, courses. And uh, I'd ask Chaplain Lane to uh, open us in a word of prayer. Thank you, sir. Allow us to pray. Almighty God, we come before you this morning as we begin our faith leaders training to say thank you. Thank you for your kindness, your goodness, for your many blessings and provisions, and especially for your love for us. Thank you for all who have worked diligently to make this event possible. Please bless our time together today. Be with our speakers as they share. Encourage each one of us as we listen to learn and allow this to be an informative, helpful and meaningful time of training. We've gathered to learn more about how to help our veterans, oh God, the men and women who have provided selfless service to our great nation, often at great personal cost. Thank you for all who have donned the uniform to serve. And we also pray for your continued protection upon our armed forces personnel, both in country and abroad. May we forever appreciate the gift of freedom and never forget the great price at which it was purchased. Let us remember our comrades who carried the torch before us and ever be quick to express our gratitude for those who still stand watch today. We ask this in your mighty name, amen. Thank you, Chaplain Lane. I'm now going to uh, share my screen and then um, we'll get this set up for you. There we go. Everyone should be able to see this. Uh, uh, as we talked about, Chaplain Western and myself are going to be doing the, the uh, primary uh, training aspect of it. But these are the four uh, sponsoring organizations. I said a little bit about them um, between our, the Cohen Clinic here, the VA, Firewatch, and Operation Uniform. You'll hear from leaders uh, from uh, each one of those because we feel like it's important we kind of set the table of, number one, why we did it, but also uh, how each one of these organizations can help. First person I'd li I like to uh, bring on is uh, Josh Pridgen. Josh is the Associate Director for Primary Care and Outpatient Clinics for the North Florida South Georgia Veterans Health System. He serves as a member of the Executive Leadership Team and oversees 16 sites of care across North Florida, South Georgia. Josh, thanks for being here. If you could talk to us a little bit about the VA, thank you. Sure, thank you. And on behalf of our leadership team, I just wanna say thank you guys for all coming together and um, learning and collaborating about military and uh, our veterans and 
uh, all of them in your communities. So I wanna talk a little bit about VA and the structure of VA. Uh, our secretary is Dennis McDonough and the VA is split into three different branches. So you have the Veterans Benefit Administrations that and they uh, administer over compensation and pension exams, education, home loans, GI Bill, things like that. You have the National Cemetery Administration, which does our memorial and burial services. Then you have the VHA, which is what we work under, uh, Veterans Health Administration. So we do healthcare, uh, we do medical research, <laughs> professional training, lots of residents coming through. Um, we also do emergency preparedness and we back up the Department of uh, Defense's medical system. So with NVA, we're split up into about 23 different regions, and as we call them VISNs, Veterans Integrated Service Networks. We serve about 9 million veterans across the country through these 23 networks. There's about 171 medical centers and over 1,100 outpatient clinics. So we are in VISN 8 or Region 8, and that's the state of Florida, and there's and a few counties in, in South Georgia. And there's 739,000 enrolled veterans receiving care in Florida in Vision 8, and that's the largest in the country. Uh, so the North Florida, South Georgia health system uh, covers North Florida, South Georgia, as the title suggests. Um, but there are, <laughs> we do cover, uh, I believe it's 29 different counties in, um, in South Georgia. And you'll see that on a slide here in just a minute. Um, but as you can see, we have sites of care. Uh, we have two medical centers, one in Gainesville, that's our primary site, uh, also city. And then the Diamonds are our large outpatient clinics. So that's Tallahassee, Jacksonville, and the Villages. And the smaller circles are our smaller outpatient clinics. So we, we do have North Florida, South Georgia is the largest healthcare system within the VA system. So 19, 19 counties in Georgia, 29 counties in Florida. In fiscal year 21, which ended in uh, September, we served over 146,000 veterans uh, just in our uh, catchment area. We, had, we complete 1.7 million outpatient visits and, and 68,000 bed days of care. So within our population, our largest uh, patient population receiving care from us is from the Persian Gulf War era. And VA describes that as starting in the 90s going through present day. And then the Vietnam era is our second largest population. It's about 32% of our veterans that we serve. And then women veterans are now making up 10% of all of the veterans served, 10% of that 146,000. Uh, so just in our healthcare system, we have about 5,800 employees, 32% uh, of those being veterans an annual budget of about 1.5 billion. So within North Florida, South Georgia healthcare system, we have the Jacksonville market and that's our largest market. So between Nassau, Duval, Clay County and St. John's counties, we have about 71,000 veterans that are enrolled with us and get healthcare with us. Now there are lots more veterans in your communities in this market, uh, but about 71,000 have access to their VA benefits. So in Duval County, we have uh, three sites of care. We have the Jacksonville Outpatient Clinic over on Jefferson Street, satellite clinics on University Boulevard and South Point Drive. And in Clay County, we have the Middleburg Community-Based Outpatient Clinic. And down in St. John's County, we have the Sur Sergeant Ernest Boots Thomas Outpatient Clinic. And that's a beautiful new lo location that just opened in uh, 2021. Also, um, given that the uh, Jacksonville market is so large, we just broke ground on a 28 acre site off of Max Leggett Parkway. And that's gonna be a 160,000 square foot new outpatient clinic. Uh, and it'll also have a 30 bed domiciliary, which is a transitional housing unit. Um, so we broke ground on that just last month and we expect completion of that in late 2023. And we'll start seeing patients there in 2024. Uh, so that's a little bit about our VA healthcare system and uh, the, the veterans that we serve in your communities. And just wanted to go over that with you guys. Um, and we're very fortunate uh, to have excellent chaplains within the VA, Chaplain Wester, you heard from Chaplain Lane earlier. Um, they, they interact in veteran lives every day, just like you guys do. And uh, I think you're gonna hear a lot of excellent training from them. Um, 
today. And we just greatly appreciate you guys being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh, for that. Uh, the next uh, sponsor, but not, if I would mention also that if you have questions, please put them in the chat because that's something that we'll get. Uh, Scott Hudson, who's our marketing director, is monitoring that, and we will uh, we'll provide answers uh, to that. Um, the next sponsoring organization, as you see there, is the uh, Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Centerstone. Uh, Liz Schur is our clinic director. Unfortunately, she's working a case right now, so she's not in here with us, but that's great because she's out, she's doing, as you see, Liz has uh, got a very interesting background. She's uh, an Army veteran. She was a retired signal officer who decided she hated IT, didn't want to work in the IT field, and became a clinician because she really wanted to commit herself to her fellow uh, military veterans. And then also, she is an Army spouse. In fact, her husband just deployed this past Monday, a week ago, to Ukraine. And then she's also an Army mom. Her son has been deployed a number of times. He's currently up at uh, Fort Drum in New York. So Liz really has the experiences uh, to talk to people about the uh, military experience and how it impacts on uh, not only the individual veteran, but families. A little bit about the Cohen Clinic, where we are today. And then the, uh, it was founded by Stephen Cohen. Mr. Cohen had a, uh, one of his sons was in the military, in the Marine Corps. He wanted to do something to honor his son's service. So he created, invested almost $300 million to uh, build a series of clinics across the United States. And you see there service members, post 9 11 post 9 11 veterans and all military families. And the mission here, it's really, it's outpatient mental health. And you'll see there on the screen, it's uh, low cost to no cost. What that means is by law, we have to ask about uh, insurance, but if someone cannot afford the care or can't afford a copay, then we can waive all fees. Mr. Cohen, we're very fortunate to have an investor like Mr. Cohen allows us to do that. And then what we do, it's, it's very accessible. Our goal is that when someone calls a clinic that they're seeing a clinician within two weeks. Normally the in-processing starts the next day. And then that way you can have, uh, figure out what kind of care is needed. And then we can start the care within two weeks. Uh, one of the big parts about that also is we have a case manager, Diane Stover, who really can help uh, for any other kind of challenges someone may be having. It could be unemployment, it could be housing, it could be anything. Sometimes the care that we provide maybe isn't the right fit for that individual. And so that's a key element. Diane can help with getting connected to other services here in uh, both North Northeast Florida or wherever you are listening uh, from this from. And you see there, it's, it's really, it's outpatient because one of the challenges with the military, and you'll hear in the military experience is, a lot of veterans don't want to talk about the challenges that they have. And so part of that is encouraging people to, uh, to seek care. This is where the uh, locations are. We have a sister clinic in uh, Tampa, uh, a company by the name of Aspire runs that. And then we also have direct uh, sister clinics in Clarksville, Tennessee, which is just outside of Fort Campbell, and also out of Fayetteville, which is just outside of Fort Bragg. But anywhere you can have care, and plus these are the physical locations well, we have a total of about 25 different states that we're a part of. Our, our clinic is going to provide care actually to Vermont. It would be an interesting story where we're trying to uh, continue to expand. But specifically about who we serve, you'll see there kind of from the left to the right, uh, it's, it's primarily post 9-11 veterans, uh, but we'll, we won't turn anybody away. About 10% of the people we see are pre-9-11 veterans and National Guard and Reserve. And a couple of key factors is if someone has served one day in the military, they're eligible for care from us. But sometimes people get to basic training and they get hurt or something happens and they can't, they don't make it through, we still can provide care to them. Also discharge status doesn't, doesn't matter. And that's a real key element. There's sometimes the, uh, the criteria for, to use uh, VA benefits can be based on your uh, discharge. And sometimes there's some limitations there. We don't have those limitations. A service members there that are currently active. Uh, many of you have active duty personnel who are in your uh, houses of worship and they are eligible for care also and all family members. One of the interesting things about that, we let the individual veteran define his or her family. And so if it's somebody's brother was very uh, helpful, it could be a best friend. If, that, if, the, if our client says, this is part of my family, then those individuals become eligible not just for care as a family member, but also individually. And so that's, that's a retail, and that can be particularly caretakers. 
We have a lot of uh, aging veterans. Uh, I probably would be in that category <laughs> myself as an aging veteran. Fortunately, my wife takes care of me. I don't have to worry about it. But uh, but that's the, the caretakers really have a tremendous responsibility. And sometimes it's a family member. Sometimes it's just a friend. Could be any. They, those individuals need support, and we can provide care for them. Again, this is a little bit about, uh, talked about the accessibility, the, the screenings. We have evidence-based practices. Uh, we have tremendous clinicians. Uh, and the one, one key area there, just like the VA, uh, VA only sees military clients, so they have a great deal of military cultural competency. We're the same way. And that's one of the challenges uh, is military cultural competency. That's why you're here today, to enhance your military cultural competency. As a clinician who understands the military experience, and sometimes military experience as you'll hear when I go through my part of it, and certainly with Chaplain Wester is, you know, just because someone stopped serving five years ago, seven years ago, 10 years ago, there still can be ramifications from that military experience. And so our military cultural competency is, is very high here. And obviously privacy of medical records, where while we're connected with the uh, uh, military, obviously because we see military clients, we're independent, but if someone needs something, if uh, like our active duty members, need something and they sign a, a release of information, we can provide the information, but that's up to our, our clients. And this is the care that we have. This is certainly not, a, but these are just some of the things that uh, our military is facing uh, with depression, anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. All those are different elements that we have, but, but really it can be any kind of uh, where someone's mental wellness, they need it improved, we can be helpful. And then telehealth, uh, our clinic literally opened last year in March, and guess what happened? COVID hit. We literally had to close it up for inpatient for uh, almost 15 or 16 months. Uh, now, as you're here, obviously, we're seeing patients. It's about a 40-60 mix, about 40% in person, about 60% telehealth. But we found, as you see, the studies have been done that the uh, telehealth is just as, uh, can be just as effective as uh, in person. And this is a connect to care. Uh, we'll, and we're gonna be sending the, uh, the decks out to everyone. So everybody's who attending, you're gonna get that and you'll have all the contact information, but that's all our uh, contact information uh, there where you are. But really have a tremendous organization. I'm very blessed to be working for them. And again, felt we felt as part of the Cohen Veterans Network that we wanted to provide this uh, faith leader uh, training. Next, I call on Michelle McManaman is uh, on the, uh, uh, on virtually. So Michelle is the CEO of Operation New Uniform. So Michelle, if you could tell us a little bit about Operation New Uniform. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. I'm really excited about this uh, program, what we're doing for faith leaders. And for all of you faith leaders for getting online today, thank you for joining us and taking the time to really see uh, what organizations are out there that are helping our veteran community. And if you're not familiar with any of these organizations, uh, please dive in a little bit more. Feel free to contact any one of us. We'd be happy to help you find the right resources. And that's what Operation New Uniform does. We're really working with our veteran community that is dealing with the crisis of confidence. Um, they're, you know, frustrated that they're not going to find the right fit after they get out of the military to go into their next whatever that is career. Um, they're worried that they're not gonna be able to support their family. And quite frankly, um, they're frustrated with all of the rejections that they've gotten from you know, different jobs that they've applied for or thought that they wanted to work at. They're usually unemployed or underemployed. And though that could be a very frustrating place. It could be a very depressing place. So Operation Uniform really focuses on helping build the confidence of our veterans and get them back to a place where they feel really good about where they are, what they've done, and translate everything that they've done in the military to be something that is gonna be um, exciting for them to get into as far as a business career. And it might not look anything like what they've done in the military, but we ask them to dream big. We want them to think about all the things that they always wanted to do and how can we make that work into what they're gonna do in their next part of their lives. So Operation Uniform, as you can see from the slide that's up, these are some of the impacts that we've had in an in-classroom two and a half week program. We have a 97% success rate of our folks getting careers, not jobs, after they've graduated our program between three and four months after they graduate. Now we've served thousands of veterans over the course of our um, time being open, um, but those are people that will connect with the Cohen Veteran Networks of the world, of, of the Firewatch and of Canines for Warriors and Wounded Warrior and all the other veteran service organizations in town. 
So um, our folks that are graduating our traditional program, which is finding the uniform program, making an average salary of $65,000. So that is um, something that helps build their confidence. You know, again, it's going from one extreme to the other as far as what they want to do in their lives. We say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Looking at this as a whole new chapter of their lives. Um, again, Operation Uniform is here to support our veteran community. It doesn't matter if they've started, you know, like Mike said, if they've been in the military for a long time or a short time, uh, we do ask that they are honorably discharged. And um, we're working with anybody who really needs our help, who's looking for that career. And if it's not that, we'll get them to the right resource. So as you can see, don't take my word for it. You're going to get this deck. These are some of our veterans and some of the things they've said about us. And then on the last page, because I know I have a very limited time, is our contact information. So feel free to reach out to us. We'll do anything to help you get to the right resource. And I'm excited to be able to get this off the ground for you faith leaders to get out to your community. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate it. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is uh, veteran suicide across the United States. We're losing between 20 and 22 veterans per day. And in North Florida, we decided we'd do something about it. And the, um, the counties of Duval County, Baker, Clay, St. John's, and Nassau County banded together to create something called the Fire Watch. I have the honor of chairing the Fire Watch. I'm the St. John's County representative. But uh, Nick Callen is our executive director. He's really been a dynamic uh, leader for this. So Nick's going to come up and tell you a little bit about Fire Watch and how it can support you. All right. Thank you, General. So. The Firewatch is Northeast Florida's fight to end veteran suicide. We're doing that by prevention. So our mission is to end veteran suicide by preventing veteran suicide. And the primary way we're doing that is by engaging the community. What we're trying to do at the Firewatch is build an early intervention network of community members who can recognize the warning signs of veterans in crisis, know how to ask them if they need help, and then know how to get them to the help they need. We call that our Watch Center program. So the Watch Center program is modeled after CPR. If you look at the 20th century in the 1900s, you see that men over age 55 were dying by heart attack at an inordinate rate. And the numbers continued to go up despite more investment in cardiologists, um, growth of heart wings, more emergency equipment. It wasn't until the 1970s when they launched the CPR program that involved the community engage community members to recognize the early signs of someone going into heart distress and then to get help early, that they see, started to see a marked decline in heart attacks. That's what we're trying to do with our watch trainer program. So we're not trying to replicate the amazing resources that exist in our community. You know, we just heard from three of them, the VA, the Cohen Clinic, Operation New Uniform. We're not trying to replicate that. What we're trying to do is have community members recognize that when veterans are at risk, there are resources out there for them and they can get them to those resources. So our program, the Watch Standard program is about a 30 to 45 minute training. It's available to anybody online at thefirewatch.org. Um, it involves a short course that was put together for us by an organization called Psych Armor, um, which is out of San Diego. It's a nonprofit that is really the nation's leading military and veteran cultural um, training organization. And um, it basically teaches you just that, to recognize those warning signs and to get veterans the help they need. Once you go through that training, we ask you to stand watch. And what we mean by that, everyone who here or uh, is a veteran understands generally the concept of watch standing, but, but we want you just to be vigilant to the concerns of veterans. If we're trying to end suicide by preventing suicide, we want you to be able to recognize some of those early warning signs and be able to get someone help. Those warning signs might be financial distress, relationship issues, difficulty with transitions, et cetera. And so what we just ask is that you, having taken the training, get out there in veteran events um, and just be vigilant to the concerns of veterans. If you do go through the training, you'll get a certificate you can print. Um, you'll get a, a, a car sticker, um, a wristband for your, for your wrist and only watch standards get that. And most importantly, a wallet card. And the wallet card reminds you of the training um, that you've just taken so you can carry it with you always and be ready to take action. Lastly, we have a program called the Veteran Safe Place Program. And why I'm bringing this up, and I know I'm limited in time, but the Veteran Safe Place Program is the organizational equivalent of our Washington program. So we're asking businesses, churches, um, nonprofits, retail outlets to train their employees or their members as watch changers, 
Um, and then they become a veteran safe place. You get a sticker for your door at the retail place you might be, you get an e-badge to put on your website. Um, but most importantly, this enables a fire watch to, to plan where we drive more watch standards and build a support network. So on the back end, the fire watch has data in North Florida on where our highest risk communities are. Using the Veteran Safe Place program, we can drive watch standard participation in those areas. If we know there's an area, for example, in Clay County between Middleburg and Penny Farms that's high risk of suicide with a high number of counts and a high rate, we can get churches, libraries, retail shops, all there trained as veteran safe places to increase the number of watch standards and our support network. That's why we have the Veteran Safe Place program. And our goal together, if we enroll as many watch standards as we can, as many people in our support network out there to stand watch, to be vigilant to the concerns of veterans and get them to the help they need, we think we can start reducing suicide by preventing suicide. That's the fire watch. Thank you. So that's why, uh, really, that, that gives you an idea. And, and the four organizations that are sponsoring this are really just indicative of what you'll see when we talk about resources across Northeast Florida and really fortunately across the United States. Uh, so really what, and, and now kind of talk now about the military experience. And uh, as you can see there, the, the faith leaders, you are on the front line. You are on the front line with our, uh, not our veterans, but the military families. And really what we talk about, and you will talk about military families specifically, but they're the ones that have many of the challenges. I mean, in the military, I was in the military 36 years and I was in both, the, I was enlisted Marine, I was an officer in the Marine Corps and an officer in the army. And, uh, you know, my family had to do a lot of things without me. And so that's one of the challenges. So we appreciate you being on the front line. You see there about the, uh, the worldview and mindset, just like any kind of uh, group that you'd be assisting, it's important that you understand the, uh, what, something about them. And then, you know, there are unique characteristics about the military impact on, on people's families. There's, yeah, we hear about veterans, we just passed Veterans Day, many great celebrations across Northeast Florida, across the United States, but everyone has an individual story, an individual impact on how it impacted their lives. Generally speaking, the impact is good. Most veterans have a good experience, uh, come out, uh, almost most of them don't stay for retirement, like I, I'm unusual to stay that long but the, there is an impact in life. And then you see the, the single most important takeaway down there is really for you to understand the impact and then do something with that information. And then we talk about different types of languages, just like every organization, any kind of sort of industry has its own. Uh, when I retired from the military, I was a managing director with Deutsche Bank, so the financial services industry had its, has its own language. I was uh, worked at Jacksonville University. Education has its own language. All of them has its own language. And uh, the military is famous for acronyms. And so we try to demystify that. And we have something that is, I think, good for you. Will so help you at a place where you can figure out some of the acronyms. Uh, but even within the services, it's interesting because I don't know all the Navy acronyms, the Air Force acronyms, because I was a Marine and a soldier. So some of them, I just nod my head and act like I know what they were talking about. But you'll see something about this, why somebody, and then part of that is taking away the awkwardness because you know many of us have had the uh, people say, thank you for your service, which is fantastic. That's great. And we appreciate that. But it's taking, it's going beyond thank you for your service to do something specific. And that's really the challenge I think we have across our United States is so many people have said, thank you for your service. And they do that sincerely. But what they'd like to do is take another step, but they don't know what that next step is. And so when, when Nick talked about with the fire watch, what we're doing today, that, that's the next step. And so we'll look, first thing we'll talk about is military culture and, uh, and civilian culture. And uh, you'll hear people talking about, and Michelle talked about that with Operation New Uniform, about to transition from the military. And on the left-hand side, the, uh, the military talks a little bit about the military culture. Uh, contrary to, to public perception, sometimes uh, we're not ordered around all the time when to get up and when to do everything. I mean, in, in basic training, uh, like I, I'm a Marine, and so we started Paris Island. And Believe me, they told me when to get up and they told me when to go to bed and everything. And one of the interesting things the Marines do is 
uh, when you go to boot camp, you're not allowed to use the word I. You have to say be private and then something. You have to request permission to speak. It's to get you away from thinking about yourself and thinking about others. That is, I'm a private part of a bigger group. And so you see there on the, on the, on the left-hand side, the collective uh, tight-knit group, all those are, are, are very important. On the right-hand side, and this is not a, a critical aspect of it, it's more individualistic simply because of its nature, which is, which is fine. And then self-reliance and all that, that's all great. It helps you in business, it helps you in life. But in the military, you used to be in, in, in part of a team. And then you've got, you're in much more in the civilian world, uh, you work normally nine to five. You know, when you go home, while certainly the organization for which you work cares about you, they are not responsible for you 24 seven. When you're on active duty, you are the military's responsibility 24 seven. When you're a commanding officer, if you're a senior non-commissioned officer, you are just as responsible for them when they're at home, not to supervise them at home, but to make sure that they, we created conditions for them to be a successful family member. And so that's really one of the, the big aspects of, and sometimes the transition to that type of environment where it's less, we'll call it less disciplined. Um, and because it was interesting, when I was at Jacksonville University, we had orientation for veterans coming in to be at school. And uh, we would tell them, look, if the class says it starts at nine, that's the earliest it will start. <laughs> it, will, it will not start before nine o'clock. It may be 9.05, it may be 9.10 and 9.15. And so th that's not a reflection on the professor, that's just the way it is. And so those are some of the things that we have to, from a military cultural standpoint, that normally speaking, if, if they have an appointment with one of our faith leaders at you know, nine o'clock, they'll be there at 8.50. They want to make sure they're there before that, and they would generally expect you to be on time. Still, obviously, everybody in business, you should be on time. And so it's, that's, a, that, you know, punctuality is something that's important. And it talks about values. Um, military values, we have a lot of different things that are listed there. Each of the, um, each of the uh, services have their set of values, and it's, it's part of what you're taught at the beginning. I mean, I can still remember almost 50 years ago when I was at Paris Island, what the Marine Corps taught me about history, about the culture, about everything about the Marine Corps. Every one of the services does the same thing. Obviously, from a, in, in the civilian world, it's, it's not that same way. I mean, the businesses are different. Again, not critical, just that they're different. But you see the different things there about the military culture. Now, the good thing is, is that the, uh, the military members, when they move back into fully into civilian society, they have a lot to add because these kind of values, who wouldn't want somebody who likes unit cohesion, never leave a man behind? Those are great things. But sometimes you see there the stoicism of a controlling emotions. You're taught, you know, in my case, you're a tough Marine. You know, you can walk down, knock down walls, all that, which is great because we have to do hard things in the military. But the military has done a very poor job of mental wellness. When I was in the start in the mid 70s, I mean, you were not encouraged at all, in fact, discouraged from talking about feelings. You put it in a box. You know, if we wanted you to have a family, we would have issued you one. It's a famous saying you hear about the military. You know, and so it was to the detriment of the military. Now, the military is doing a much better job now of encouraging that. And it's not a career killer. You were viewed, oh, Fleming, he's got a you know, depression problem or something like that. You know, he's really not fit to command. He's not fit to move forward. All that, the military is getting away from that, but it's still one of the, uh, one of the challenges. So that kind of gives you a general idea of the, of the military. And, and briefly, I'll go over the, the, the military structure. And it starts off, the Secretary of Defense is always a civilian. Uh, General Mattis, who had been the Commandant of the Marine Corps, was a uh, was Secretary of Defense under President Trump, but he was a civilian at the time. So there's something, civilian control of the military. We started at day one as a nation. That was a concept that we have. And it, it is, uh, it's uh, irrevocable. It's very important. It's a fundamental aspect of that. And so it's good. And then you see there, the Secretary of Defense is appointed by the president. And then the service secretary is also appointed by the president with the approval of the Senate. And then you see there on the right-hand side, all the different um, the, the services. And you have six different uh, uh, services there. And then we have the newest one there is, uh, is Space Force. Now you see the Coast Guard is listed there uh, at the top. 
The Coast Guard day to day, when they're doing work here in the United States, they are part of the Department of Homeland Security. However, and like when they, they deployed, you have people in the Coast Guard deployed to the Persian Gulf, they are part of the Navy at that point. When they go, uh, we call it OCONUS, which is outside the continental United States, they're part of the Navy. And part of the, what you'll always see or should see is that when the servicers are listed, they are listed in the order that they were founded. So when you see the service flags, obviously the United States flag always comes first, but when you see the service flags, and many of you attended Veterans Day events, it should have been the Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Air Force, the Space Force, and then the Coast Guard. That is the correct order. So if one of your um, houses of worship has the flags listed, please list them in order, have them right in order, because your veterans will look at it and think, kind of shake their head like, okay, they're trying to do the right thing, but that's, but it's important, it's an important aspect because it's just not random, it's when each one of those were founded. So uh, the Army is the oldest of all the military branches, obviously land, uh, land-based land branch. And then the Army, just like all the, all the components, have a, a, a reserve element. And in the case for the Army, it's the uh, Army National Guard and the Army Reserve. So the Army is the largest number of uh, individuals in the services. It's, it's the largest of all of them. And it's land-based. Obviously, we do a lot of things in the Army, uh, you know, Af Iraq and Afghanistan, and uh, it's very, it's land-based, obviously. Marine Corps is second oldest. Uh, it's even older than the Navy. It was started in Tun Tavern. It started in a bar, so that's, you can make your own jokes from that, uh, but uh, that's a source of pride for Marines, but uh, the, the Army uh, is great. It's, it's very, uh, obviously, land-based. It's got uh, some aviation. It's got uh, helicopters, uh, some, some small planes, uh, but the Marine is has has its own uh, fighting force. It's got uh, obviously a land component. It's got a sea component. Obviously, it's part of the Department of the Navy, and then uh, also it's got an air component. It has jets and things, so uh, they can provide a uh, almost a self-sustaining type of um, of operation uh, overseas. Uh, most of you have seen, uh, you know, Marines do uh, hit the beach. Uh, you know, amphibious landings uh, doesn't happen as much now because. Uh, it's not needed, but that's something the Marines uh, still practice. It's part of the Navy. It's got both active duty and then the Marine Corps Reserve. Uh, the Navy, third oldest uh, branch of the military. My father was uh, in the Navy. He was stationed at uh, uh, Mayport, and they met my mom here, and I was born and raised here in Jacksonville because my dad was in the Navy. So uh, very proud of his service. Uh, I gave him a hard time when I joined the Marine Corps because I didn't realize he was a squid until that point, <laughs> uh, but that's another story. Uh, but obviously the Navy is the uh, largest Navy in the world. It gives, uh, we call uh, land, we have land dominance through the Marine Corps and the, and the Army, and then we have uh, sea dominance. And uh, one of the things you'll see quite often is the Navy uh, does something uh, with, uh, to make sure that uh, countries don't end up claiming part of the ocean that's not theirs. And so you'll see uh, China has built in the uh, uh, South, I think South China Sea, has built our, uh, islands, just created things and tried to make that sovereign. Well, we will sometimes have uh, Navy ships, uh, US Navy ships go through there to demonstrate that we don't recognize that. So uh, the Navy is, is uh, it's, it's great environment. Obviously here in Jacksonville, we're very much a Navy town, tri-base between NAS Jacks, Mayport, and also the, the, uh, the Kings Bay uh, submarine base. Air Force, uh, obviously air dominance. It grew out of the Army Air Corps and was started in uh, 1947, eight, 47, I think. And so became the Air Force, an independent uh, branch. And then you'll see there, uh, they have a lot of different aspects of it. They're really in, very much into cyberspace, but they've got uh, airspace and cyberspace, although their uh, uh, space mission has been reduced mm -hmm. because of uh, creating Space Force. But uh, here, they have both uh, the Air National Guard and the Air Force Reserve, a part of the reserve component. You fly into Jacksonville International Airport when you see the uh, F-15s uh, parked there. That's the Air National Guard of Florida Air National Guard. And the Space Force is the newest one. It's, uh, it's really because the space is, is a new environment for, uh, unfortunately, for combat. It's not a peaceful uh, area there. And so we have to have uh, the ability to interdict there. And so the Space Force... And they just started in 2019. They're called the Guardians. And so they are uh, an element that uh, uh, people are joining. I've just, I actually had uh, talked to somebody whose uh, daughter is now in the Space Force. So 
it's it's now uh, they're now enlisting people in the Space Force, but then also they're taking uh, people from other branches, primarily the Air Force, but all services into the Space Force. Coast Guard is uh, part of the military, as I said, in the um, times of combat, but they, they do great work on a day-to-day -day basis, obviously, for, uh, uh, for boating here in uh, maritime safety, also environmentalism. So you have here, we have uh, on the, the river, we have the, the Jacksonville sector, we have uh, right there on the St. John's River, we have it. They, they uh, trace their uh, heritage back to the revenue cutter in 1792. They're actually uh, obviously older than the Air Force, but because the order of precedence is, is built on, on the Department of Defense, the Coast Guard is, the, is normally the last flag in the uh, uh, display. Now the types of service also are very important because you have active duty personnel. Generally speaking, the, people, the sailors you see in uniform around here are on active duty. That means they're 24 seven, that's what they're doing. And one of the key elements is they have full access to benefit. You've heard of the word TRICARE. TRICARE is the military medical system for dependents. We call, we call them dependents, family members for that. And then for, for me as a military, military retiree, I had TRICARE. But that, that's the, they have some medical at the bases that is now primarily for the military aspect, uh, for the military serving members. A couple of years ago, they started reducing the number of medical personnel in the, in the military forces and so that, uh, that uh, forced uh, family members, retirees to go, we call it into town or to use civilian medical care. And so when you are talking with a military member, uh, you know, the active duty, they have full access to, to benefits. Their benefits are very strong and very good. Now, the Guard and Reserve is a bit different. You sign up and uh, used to say it was uh, two days a month and then two weeks out of the year. Now that after 9-11 was blown out of the water Reserve components, the National Guard Reserve serve a lot more time than that. However, they don't get benefits unless they are on some kind of duty status. Most of the time, they're not in a duty status. And so they're working for Florida Blue, they're working for CSX, they're working for a company, and they are dependent normally on their civilian job for their medical benefits. And so that's something when they come to you for care, you're, you can't just send them, let's say it's a, uh, you know, reservist or guardsman. They don't have access to the uh, dispensary or the medical care at NES, Jacks or Mayport. They are dependent, again, on the uh, civilian care. So that's a bit of a difference because most people see somebody in uniform and figure, okay, they got all the benefits. In this case, they don't. It's the active duty do and the guard and reserve um, do not. Nothing wrong with that, that's not a complaint. I had about 24 years of active duty, about 12 years, years of Guard and Reserve, but it's just a fact. And I think sometimes as faith leaders, I think that's an important element. In the far right, there's something called Individual Ready Reserve. It's uh, you sign up in the military, you have eight years of obligation to the military, even if you only serve for four years. We really don't call people back from the Individual Ready Reserve, but if you can think of them as a deep bench, if we had a catastrophic something, and really need to mobilize everybody, you could do that. I guess they could call me back. Uh, we'll see, Hope, hopefully <laughs> we'd be in bad shape if they did that, so. <laughs> Military rank is a, is a little bit, is important element also. And it, it really is uh, structured. We, you can walk in a room in the military, if everybody's in uniform, you can figure out who the senior person is. It's pretty easy. In a business environment, you know, you're in a suit or whatever you're in, you really can't. I mean, obviously once the, so the meeting starts, you can figure out, Who's that? But in the military, you can do that. And again, it's, it helps us. It, uh, it defines it. it uh, it's, it's structured, which is great. But one of the things that we do when we're looking at this is particularly the enlisted personnel, we really look at them as leaders. I was fortunate. I'm what's called a Mustang officer because I was both an enlisted Marine and then I went to OCS, officer candidate school after that. And so the enlisted members really are by far the, as far as numbers are by far the, the biggest numbers. And then you have them and you start off when you're a scared private, like I was at Paris on, you're just kind of not screw, trying not to screw up. You're just trying to do whatever someone tells you to do. But as you go up, what we do, we have, uh, you start off and you become a non-commissioned officer. And the non-commissioned officers really drive our military. It's unlike a lot of the militaries across the, uh, across the world our non-commissioned officers, our sergeants, our, our corporals, our uh, master chiefs, all those are very important leaders. In fact, the uh, officers give broad guidance, the non-commissioned officers make things happen. 
And so that's something that I, I think obviously is a, I was a general officer, right? So people figure I did something right at some point in my career, but the same respect that you have when you see the, the enlisted ranks here as you go and the top of it, you'll see E1, that's called pay grades. All right, the pay grades only tell us how much someone's being paid. What, if you can, when you get to know somebody is to know what their rank was, not say you're an E8 or something like that, because it's, a, it's very prestigious. And you go to the far right there, you'll see there the E9, which is a senior, it's, it's a sergeant major. It's a, a chief master sergeant in the, in the uh, Air Force or a master chief petty officer. Those senior people have done a lot of things. They deserve the same respect, frankly, that a, that a general officer would or flag officer would. So it's understand, it's important and you can figure out how much the, uh, you know, by their rank, normally how long they served and the type of responsibility they have. Officers, you get a, uh, what's called a presidential commission. You've heard your, your con Congress says you're an officer and a gentleman. I don't know about that, but you're an officer. And, um, so the president has to sign off on it. The Senate has to approve you each promotion, not only when you get commissioned at the first time, but each time you get uh, get promoted. And you'll see there the uh, 0103, and I'll show that in just a second. In fact, I'll show it now. Uh, Left-hand side, you're a second lieutenant ensign. You have a lot of jokes about second lieutenants and ensigns yeah. because we're we're all the newbies. And uh, and then you move to the right there. You, those are the uh, the different ranks. Um, uh, someone told me yesterday that he in the army he in Jacksonville he only wants to be a captain because in the in the navy a captain is the equivalent of a colonel. So an army captain, if you get called a captain, people think you're like uh, maybe the same as a navy captain. So, uh, but here you see the the different ranks that you have uh, on the far right are the uh, starting at 07. I was a, I'm a retired brigadier general, I was a one one star general, and they're called flag officers because you actually get a flag that's flown out. When you're in the building, they hang a flag out, say that there's a general or an admiral there. It's pretty good for the ego, I can tell you. It's really, it's, <laughs> I can't get my wife to do that. She, really does, she doesn't, she's not interested in, in uh, having that even when I'm home. So, but those are the, the, the ranks and it's important because it really, for, for you, it, it tells you about either where they are, if they're currently serving and some of the challenges they have, and then also uh, what they would have experienced. This is, and you'll hear, you'll see something, and we'll have something from Psych Armor here in a minute, but it's the, the basic element is, is that is to, is to call somebody by the right name. Mm -hmm. You'll see a lot of times you'll say soldiers, soldiers as kind of a generic term for every military member. Uh, I can see people here in this room who would not like to be called soldiers. Right. I got a couple <laughs> of them to my right and uh, who are in the Navy. And uh, uh, so they... So is to know that, simply know that fundamental aspect. Because if someone says, hey, I was a sailor, and you say, well, what's it like being in the Army? I mean, <laughs> you will turn them off immediately. Wow. And it, I mean, and that happens. Yep. And so it's important that, that, that you know that, just those fundamental things. And then we talk about a service member and active duty. I mean, those are the people currently serving. Normally, when we say service member, you're saying that. And then we use the term military dependent. And uh, it's, it's really a family member. And that just, it's more, that's, that she's more in the military just to define who your, who your family is. And then a veteran, this is by far the biggest. There's about 20 million veterans uh, across the United States. And then when you look at the family members as a part of that, uh, you know, it's, it's at least double that, if not more, if you look at the generations that are, are part of that. And so uh, veterans, you see the, uh, the VA de uh, definition of it. And then you see there that, uh, you know, veterans have served at different levels. We had a great event yesterday for Welcome Home Vietnam Veterans. As a nation, we, we did an awful job, a really dishonorable job of bringing what, uh, Vietnam veterans home. And so some, they served in Vietnam, but uh, some have served in combat zones. Some people haven't served in combat zones, but it's, it's just uh, it's something with the military veterans. It's important that, to know that they all have served. And then they'll have various degrees of um, benefits that they're eligible for. And one thing I would encourage you as faith leaders is one of the first questions that you should ask is, have you registered with the VA? Mm -hmm. That is absolutely one of the first questions you should be asking because the VA is our nation's commitment to veterans. And Josh, who was here, uh, Chaplain Wester for the VA, uh, Dr. Melinda Screws is a chief medical officer here. They're tremendous. We are fortunate in this area to have a dynamic 
VA presence here, but you can't get the uh, care if you're not registered. Mm -hmm. And so just because, and if someone says, well, I had a VA loan for my house, that does not get you registered for medical. Mm -hmm. There's different registrations. So that's something I'd say as faith leaders, one of the first things is, is to make sure you're asking them if they have uh, um, applied for the VA or registered the VA. Now, some of the verbiage you heard Michelle from uh, Operation Uniform talk about this, transition and separation. It's you're transitioning out of the military back into civilian life. And you really never completely leave, lose civilian life when you're in the military because you're part of the civilian community, obviously. But you really, it's, you're leaving something. Uh, many of you have left jobs. One place you felt great about it for various reasons, you had to move to another one. It can be pretty traumatic. And also it's, it's traumatic in the sense that, um, you know, if you're on active duty, you have medical, all, a lot of things I say taken care of that are part of the benefit package. And then you're going and all of a sudden you have to select a, uh, you know, something for your family, a medical plan. Well, what is that? It's a medical plan with deductibles and things. I didn't have that in the military. So all those are things. And then the uh, transition to separation can be quite, uh, quite challenging. So that's a, a broad look at the military. And what I'd like to do now is to, uh, uh, Nick had mentioned Psych Armor. Psych Armor is a tremendous organization dedicated to educating people across the United States about the military. And I'd like to play something for you that's 15 things veterans want you to know so you can understand kind of the, the aspect of, of thinking what I've just given you as kind of foundation. And then this is how some of the ways that we want veterans, that veterans want you to know. I'm a clinical psychologist and the clinical director at Psych. Why? I just wanted to underscore, you're going to hear some vocabulary that will be so helpful to you as a faith leader in engaging the veteran in the form of specific questions to ask. I just wanted to make that point. Okay. You're going to get verbatim things that will help you. Yep. Grammar Institute. I am a Navy veteran. I spent nine years on active duty in the Navy and deployed to Iraq in 2004 with a Marine Corps surgical company. I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce a new way of thinking about military culture. America is a country made up of people from countless different cultural backgrounds. Certainly, it's part of what makes us great. For some time now, people have been trying to understand what it means to be culturally competent. The military is a culture, just like any other. Military people, like those from any culture, have certain beliefs, practice certain rituals and traditions, and hold fast to certain ideals that shape who they are as a group of people. In order to bridge the gap between non-military Americans and those who wear the uniform of their country, military cultural competence is an important first step. So what are the most important parts of a culture to understand? Well, we went to the source. We asked our veterans. We asked thousands of American veterans, what is one thing you would want your doctor, nurse, therapist, employer, anyone in your life, really, who's trying to understand you, to know about you? This course is based on their top 15 answers. First and foremost, ask a very important question. Did you serve in the military? It matters, and it begins the conversation. You see, in the military, we have our own history and our own language. In fact, if you listen to military people talk, it's truly as if they're speaking a different language. We have very specific traditions, and they are richly written throughout history. They often tell you who we are. For instance, at a ball game, when the national anthem is played, you'll see military people standing at attention, even long after they've left active duty. We take pride in our sacrifices, and sometimes we feel like people who haven't lived our lives can't understand. So asking, did you serve in the military, is a great way to begin a conversation and to engage a veteran. As an active duty Marine said, we are not like you. The veteran and his family are tough, but have the biggest hearts and have gone through huge sacrifices and a broad spectrum of emotions many times. Knowing that, please start the conversation. Ask a person if he or she served. If the answer is yes, let's move on to the 15 things veterans want you to know. Number one, we are not all soldiers. 
This is a big one for military people, and if there is one thing to take away from this course, it would be this. While many people, including those in the media, talk about military personnel, they refer to soldiers as a general term. This is not correct. Soldiers are only in the Army. There are four other branches in the armed services, and they are very different. They have different missions and even different subcultures. Although we are all part of that same larger team, military people are proud of their specific service branches. Very importantly, you do not need to know specifics about what the Coast Guard does, or what the ranking structure of the Air Force is, or what you call a person in the Navy. You don't need to know why the Marines' mission is different from the Army's. But knowing that these five branches are different is the first and important step to military cultural awareness. So this leads us to an important follow-up question. If a person answers yes, he or she served, the next question should be, which branch? Asking this question demonstrates that you know the difference between the five branches. I guarantee this earns you instant credibility with that veteran, and it keeps the conversation going, which is the whole point. Number two, the reserves are part of the military. There are two ways to serve in uniform in our country. One is active duty, in which case your full-time job is putting on the uniform and fulfilling your role in the armed forces every day. The other way is the reserves. These are people who train and stay ready to be called up if they're needed. Members of the reserves who are seen in every branch train together one weekend a month and two weeks a year. When not in uniform, they go back to their civilian jobs in their communities. They will be called to help when our country needs them, either to augment a national defense-related mission or, sometimes in the case of the National Guard, to help in domestic, national, or local emergencies where additional support is required. When reservists are mobilized and deployed, they come home from their deployments and go right back to their civilian communities. But often, they don't have the same support or resources as an active duty person does when they return. This can cause a significant amount of additional stress on military reservists and their families. Number three, not everyone in the military is infantry. When we think of the classic generic version of the military person, we definitely think of infantry. This is an image probably fed through our culture from the time we're young. But the truth is the range of what people do in the military is truly remarkable. We are expertly trained in literally hundreds of jobs from mechanics, cooks, pilots, and sailors, to divers, administrators, doctors, musicians, to weapons specialists, military police, firefighters, and air traffic controllers. We operate, maintain, and fix all types of weapons, aircraft, sea vessels, vehicles, equipment, and machinery. Knowing this, the third important question to ask after learning a person served and in which branch would be, what did you do during your service? What was your job? This shows that you know there are many different things a military person could have been trained to do. It's an acknowledgement or a validation of that person's training and skills and how hard he or she has worked to be an expert at that job. It also demonstrates that you understand each individual job is vital to the overall execution of the military's mission. This will help you to consider the impact of different occupations might have, physically and mentally, in order to be sensitive to that in conversation. As one veteran explains, our bodies are pounded daily. By the time I hit retirement age, I will have lost several inches off my height due to daily stress. Number four, we have leaders at every level in the chain of command. Almost immediately out of basic or officer training, military people are responsible for those that work for and with them. And there's a sense of real leadership that's engendered, taught, and truly embraced all the way down to the lowest level of the chain of command and all the way up to the highest. Leadership is a very important factor in military service. Those who wear the uniform feel responsible for others and accountable to others. And this is a large part of the pride we take in our service. Number five. We are always on duty. In the military, there are no days off, even when a person is on leave. We can be called back at a moment's notice if the unit is getting ready to deploy or in the case of an unexpected mission demand. So even when we're on vacation, we're not really on vacation. Here's a quote from a Coast Guardsman. I am always on call. I can never plan a vacation because an operation can come up at the last minute. Work schedules are pretty tough at times. Number six. We take pride in our appearance and in our conduct. 
Military people take appearance, conduct, and physical fitness very seriously. Even out of uniform, we are held to a standard with regard to how we look. Physical fitness matters in a real way. We need to train so that when we're called, we're ready to accomplish that mission. Likewise, we're responsible for maintaining a standard of conduct. In fact, active duty people are held to an actual code of military justice. It's a set of rules that governs military people, and we can be charged with crimes based on these rules and held accountable in court. Some people have perceptions about military people that maybe they're rigid based on the way they look. In fact, we like to think of ourselves not as rigid, but as proud. Simply stated, this is just the way we've been brought up, and we believe that these standards have a purpose. Number seven, we did not all kill someone, and those who have do not want to talk about it. This one doesn't need a lot of commentary. Unfortunately, this is a question that gets asked of our military veterans far too often. I realize people are just curious, but I hope this course will educate you to realize that this is not a question any military veteran wants to be asked, whether he or she has lived through this or hasn't. It's not a question that should be asked of military veterans. Please don't ask us that, ever. Number eight, we do not all have PTSD. There's a general perception that anyone who deployed to combat develops PTSD, and that's just not true. A vast majority of veterans, including combat veterans, do not go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people might have symptoms in the acute aftermath of any kind of trauma, but then experience a natural recovery process. This is also true for combat. While combat can certainly be very traumatic, it can also lead to great moments of reward and friendship and love. Number nine, those of us who do have an invisible wound are not dangerous and we are not violent. Invisible wounds of war, including post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, depression, and substance use disorder are not obvious to someone looking at a veteran, but they are real injuries causing real suffering and they deserve the same respect and treatment as physical injuries. The media has created a bias that insinuates those with PTSD might be violent. This is not true. Those of us with invisible wounds of war may be injured, but we are not violent. Number 10, it is really hard for us to ask for help. The military culture is based in service, sacrifice, and helping, or even rescuing others. It is others-based, and historically has not valued self-care or help-seeking behaviors. There's an expectation of mission accomplishment, even at personal cost. Because of this long-standing cultural bias, reaching out for help for ourselves is difficult for military people. Some veterans view asking for help as a sign of weakness. It also takes a great level of trust for a veteran to allow him or herself to be vulnerable. Please have patience and don't give up on us. Number 11, our military service changes us. That change is permanent and that's okay. We wouldn't expect anything else. Like I said, it's a culture with its own traditions, rituals, language, standards, expectations, stigma, wonderful moments and horrible moments. It's unreasonable to think that a person will go through those experiences and be unchanged. Number 12, we differ in how much we identify with the military after we leave active duty. As in any culture, some people find themselves truly defined by their service and their association with the military. Others consider it part of their past and move on from it. If I'm getting to know a veteran, I like to ask these questions. How has your military service shaped you? How does it factor into how you define yourself now? Again, there's instant credibility in those questions as it gives us a chance to see that you understand. We are all different, both while we serve and after we serve. Number 13, our families serve with us. Military families have some of the most challenging jobs in the world. They're subject to frequent separation from their loved ones and moving from place to place, sometimes every two or three years. It's difficult to establish schools for the kids or jobs for the spouses. Then the service member comes back from deployment and wants to take back some of those responsibilities that he or she used to have. And the spouse feels like, you know, I've really got this process down. I know what I'm doing now. All of this requires flexibility, bravery, strength, and resilience. Anyone who knows a military family knows that all those words define us. Number 14, we would die for each other and we would die for our country. We would and we do. It doesn't matter where we fight, the geographical location or the technologic or political backdrop. It doesn't matter what the mission is or who's in charge of the country. Why we fight has always been the same from the very beginning. It's about the people to our left and our right and any military person will tell you that. 
The people with whom we serve become brothers and sisters to us, and we would die for them, and we do, and we would not change that culture of sacrifice for the world. Number 15. We've all made this sacrifice for one reason, to serve something more important than ourselves. When it comes down to it, this defines our culture. People who choose to serve in uniform and who sign on that line, saying they will make that sacrifice, they live by a certain code. And we like to say it's honor and commitment and duty. Most of all though, these are people who make a choice. We've all chosen to serve something larger than ourselves, more important than ourselves. That's a unique and special piece of military culture that runs through everything and everyone who's part of it. We are choosing the concept of service. In summary, asking the right questions gives you credibility and brings you closer to the veterans in your lives. It opens the door for a better understanding of our experiences and our military culture. When you meet someone you think might be a veteran, ask, did you serve in the military? Which branch? What job did you do in the military? The military is a complicated culture and you do not have to know a lot of details about the military in order to show some military cultural awareness to bridge that gap between yourself and the veterans in your life. We hope this course has taught you a few important things that veterans want you to know. We're not all soldiers. The reserves are a vital part of the military. Not everyone in the military is infantry. There are hundreds of specific jobs people perform. Leadership is very important and veterans have a heightened sense of responsibility for and to others. We are always on duty. We take pride in our appearance and our conduct. We did not all kill someone, and those who have do not want to talk about it. We do not all have PTSD. Those of us who do have an invisible wound are not dangerous and not violent. It's really hard for us to ask for help. We're used to putting others and the mission before ourselves. Our military service changed us. That change is permanent, and that's okay. We all differ in how much we identify with the military after we leave active duty. Our families, Our families serve with us. Military families have some of the most challenging jobs in the world. We would die for each other and for our country. We've all made this sacrifice for one reason, to serve something more important than ourselves. Thank you so much for taking the time to take this course. I hope that this was helpful in better understanding military culture and our nation's veterans. On behalf of them all, thank you. So hopefully that was something that can give you an idea of uh, kind of kind of brought it together. As Chaplain Wester said, I, I think some of the key questions just as a start point, because I think I use the term, there's a benevolent ignorance about the military from non-veterans. They really respect the military, but other than thank you for your service, how in the world do I talk to somebody who had an experience that I know nothing about? And so that gives you some of the things because Veterans want you to ask about that, just like all of us, we're all interested in that. A uh, couple of things that were in the chat, uh, and uh, one of the, uh, we're gonna be sending a recording to everyone, and also the points of contact for all the different uh, organizations. And then plus you'll see at the end of it, we're also gonna talk about some reference guides for you, the Faith Leader page. So we'll send all that out. Uh, someone asked about uh, Firewatch, is it open in Atlanta? Firewatch training is available to any, anyone and we'll get you uh, Nick's contact information uh, for the Firewatch. Uh, but before Chaplain Wester comes up to talk specifically about working with the military members, I wanted to give you uh, some of the statistics and a little bit more of an overview. Now that you have a general idea about the military experience, what are some of the challenges that military members and military families are, are facing? You can see there, um, it, it's tragic, uh, just the suicide uh, numbers, they're, they're terrible. Uh, here in Florida, the uh, a veteran who is ages 18 to 34 is three times more likely to lose his or her life to suicide than a non-veteran. To me, that's counterintuitive because most people have a good experience in the military, but some we're, we're, we're facing this national tragedy. Firewatch, which Nick talked about, is, is a big part of what we do. But these are the statistics and some of the things that as faith leaders, you're on the front line to talk to uh, military members about. These are some of them, uh, the access to care. Uh, the, the VA does a terrific job here in Northeast Florida. Sometimes though people have a bad experience with the VA. Sometimes they, they feel like they don't have access to care, not just uh, mentally, but also physically. You'll see some of the other ones. Uh, still, 
you think about your military training, one of the first things they break you down, but then they build you back up that if you're, you're in the Air Force, you're, you know, any airman could beat up a Marine or say, I mean, yet you're better. And that's great. But challenge is if that prevents you from having, trying to get access to care that could help you. And it also is part of your, your family. One of the things that I've, I've seen uh, personally in my life is that um, my brother's father-in-law, one of my brother's father-in-law served in the Navy. And so he was getting older, needed some more care. And so the, the VA has a terrific caregiver program. And so my wife had asked my sister-in-law about it. And so she asked her dad, my sister-in-law asked her dad, and her dad said, well, I only served in the Navy for four years. Well, if I could restrict, if I could get rid of one word and talk with military service, the word only, because that's it just, but some of the older veterans mm -hmm. feel like if, hey, if I get this care, I'm taking away from someone who served in Afghanistan, maybe lost a leg. That is completely false. The VA is funded on the number of veterans that they serve, not uh, I got to choose between veterans on service. So again, you could have someone who has maybe served in Vietnam and they come to you for care and you say, have you registered with the VA? Well, I don't want to, no. Get them to register because they owe it to their families for the caregiver aspect particularly. Uh, and as all of us get older, that's, that's important. And then military families. You see here, these are some of the uh, statistics. Uh, you see the second bullet there. There are more family members. This is the active force than, uh, than there are actually military members. And you got children and spouses and things. So these are the, 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 the family aspect here. So that's specifically for currently serving uh, personnel. And you see some of those. You get down here though, with the, uh, the number three and four, uh, you have almost 19 million veterans plus or minus. Uh, veterans only and military only make up about eight or nine percent of the whole military, excuse me, the whole population of the United States. So that's why it's important what you're doing as faith leaders, you know, nine out of the 10 people I'll interact every day are not going to be veterans. The more you know about the veteran experience, the military experience, and you see this, and then I, I think of my own personal family, obviously, I, I, my dad served, and so that's my brothers and me, it affects and then I served, and then it's my, not only my children, but my grandchildren now, and hopefully for generations. And so that's something that the military experience can have ramifications for decades. Our Vietnam veterans were treated terribly. There are some of them who still have scars today from what happened 50 years ago. And so, and that becomes a generational aspect of it. Sometimes, most of the time positive, I got the I wish I could share. I got the greatest Veterans Day card from my five-year-old grandson. I almost made me cry. So, so it's good. But sometimes there are things that happen in the military that are not good. And do that. So the family is something. And then these are some of the dynamics here in Jacksonville, particularly when you have the Navy. I mean, deployments. You don't join the Navy and think I'm going to be on, on shore the whole time. I mean, you just don't do that. You know you're going to be gone. I mean, that's the Navy, the basis of the Navy. It happens all services. But I think of the Navy specifically gone for a seven month cruise. When they're gone, they're gone. Now the communication's better and everything, but you look at all those things that you have to do. And then sometimes you see the, the medical care changes there when someone transitioned from the military to a civilian world have that. And then the last one is career changes or loss of career. I mean, if you were a senior officer or senior non-commissioned officer and you come out and you're offered a minimum wage job, that can be pretty deflating because you know what you bring to the table. And we do, as a society, we do a much better job of recognizing the value of military experience in the civilian world. But still, there, sometimes that happens uh, that uh, someone doesn't get the kind of job. It takes a lot of care for that. And that's where you can be very, uh, very helpful. And these are some of the struggles. These are, uh, many of these struggles are, are struggles that you would see in any family, but these are specifically for the, for the military. And then very quickly about uh, military kids, and you'll you'll get all this, and this is uh, you know what, the, what military kids want you to know because we really ask for faith leaders. Obviously, we love you know the, the, the pastor, the head rabbi, head of mom, whoever that is, but the youth pastor is very important because the youth pastor. All right, good, okay. The youth pastor is the person who is hearing from the children who my dad is deployed over, you know, is now gone for seven months. Or this is the third time my dad's left for deployment, you know, in five years. And they'll know the word deployment, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll, they'll understand all those things. But you have all that. 
And you see things that we're all used to new kid in school here in Jacksonville, you rotate out. The military is doing a much better job of keeping people in some same place longer, but it's about three to four years and then you're gone. You're the new kid in school again. So it's one of the challenges. And then here's some tips. Obviously, the first one is that the uh, military experience has a significant impact. You just can't say, oh, well, I know you miss your dad, you know, just pray for him. And then you will talk to you got to give more than that. Again, it's, it's get beyond. Uh, thank you for your service. And then that you have different uh, impacts. So you got to look beneath the service, excuse me, surface to see what it, what it is that is maybe causing that. And it could be that they they have anxiety of being separated from their parents and things. So that's one. And again, each one of you is on the front line. So those are uh, a little bit about the uh, military experience. And um, let, me, let me look in the chat, if you don't mind real quick to see if there's any specific questions. Um, right, so that's excellent video. Okay, good, that's more questions about the video. We'll, we'll get that. Uh, any questions here in, in, here in Jacksonville or in the chat real quick to see if there's a question about military experience or move to Chaplain Western? Yes, sir. Um. The two suicides is really alarming. Yes, sir. Is there a breakdown between uh, how much of those are Army, uh, Marine, Navy, etc.? Is there is there, is the suicide rate higher? It's yeah. In some uh, right. The question. Uh, uh, here in Jacksonville was, is there a breakdown by services for the, uh, for the suicides? And, and Nick, check me on this, but uh, the Army and the Marine Corps have the highest rates of suicide. And then, uh, and then the Air Force, and then it's the Navy, and then the Air Force. Is that? I don't know the exact breakdown by service. Yeah, that's. Um, I know more by age, yeah. gender. The, yeah. But generally speaking, the right, Department of Defense, we'll, we'll supply that. The Department of Defense statistics are, uh, the way I, I laid them out. And, and one of the tragedies is that uh, the, the statistics I've given you for veterans, unfortunately, you can translate that into active duty because the 18 to 34 has the highest rates, that's active duty and also veterans. So uh, it really, uh, someone on active duty is obviously under stress at that point, they're having the same challenges. So that's why with the Firewatch, we work with the uh, the Navy here in Jacksonville, but uh, we'll get you the specifics. But it's it's the Army and Marine Corps first, and then the um, and then the Air Force. Excuse me, and then the Navy, and then the Air Force. One of the other, uh, the highest current rate in the Department of Defense actually is the Army National Guard. It's the reserve component, and that's one of the challenges with the Guard and Reserve that I talked about. My last position, I was the uh, Assistant Adjutant General for the Florida Army National Guard, and the challenge to come back from deployments is that while there are, you get uh, six months of uh, care from TRICARE, you go back from a cohesive environment and you go back to your civilian life. And that's a challenge because uh, generally speaking, you come back to work, people make a big deal, which they should that, hey, you served, but two, three weeks later, hey, I'm Mike Fleming working at my job. You don't expect to parade each day because you served in the military, it was your job, you just don't. But then there can be, you can feel a little lost because you had such a cohesive group and each day you were facing things together and now you're a bit cut adrift. And so that's one of, one of the challenges. Yes, sir. Speaking as a Navy veteran, going to the Jaguar game and standing up and clapping yeah. for the veterans and somebody next to me who's a civilian will say, thank you for your service. It's very humbling. Yet, I will say as a veteran, it's always nice when that next question comes, oh, so what did you do? Right. Well, I was a radar man, I was a... Uh, e6 uh, served and, and so that's great what they're saying on the video to those of you who are not veterans uh, if you can just don't say thank you for your service ask a question and it really makes the veteran feel even better right exactly right yes sir absolutely yes yeah i'm gonna we'll, we'll send it will all go out what we'll do is we're going to send you the uh not only the full presentation We'll send that link out separately. So if you just want to use that, because you could show that in your, your house of worship or in anything and, uh, you know, get that. But then you'll see the faith, uh, faith leader resource page. 
So now that y'all had a, kind of a fundamental understanding, really you're not experts, but give you that. Let me uh, bring Chaplain Wester up to kind of talk about from the, specifically about the connection point from the faith. Yes, sir, I'm sorry, one question. Because, um, I, I didn't have to sign up, and you signed up, so how do I get you? If you just grab one of my cards right over there and just send that, we'll, we'll get that information okay. to you. The question was that uh, if someone didn't sign up, then uh, what you can do is if you'll just, if you're online, if you just put it in the chat and we will capture that. If you have an email that we want something sent to, glad to do that. Okay. Thank you. Chaplain, any other questions? Chaplain Wester. Thank you so much, General Fleming. I can't be more pleased to be with you. I'm just delighted uh, to have you join in this faith leader event today. Uh, as a VA chaplain, as a retired Army chaplain, and as a Lutheran clergy person, I'm very pleased to try to make a connection with you here, here in the room and also with those of you online. So for our agenda this morning, I'd like to, in about the next 30 minutes, cover three topics, and they'll be very unevenly distributed. I've got one or two slides for the beginning around vision. The bulk of this will focus on your engagement with individual veterans, military members, and their families. And then I've got a couple of closing slides to talk about leadership in your own faith community. I wanna offer a couple of caveats. Uh, I know my motivations and I also recognize limitations. So by way of motivations, I'm coming at this with a sense of humility, uh, knowing that your experience is really relevant and I'm curious about that. But even with my best of intentions, I'm also aware that I have blind spots. Some of those I'm aware of, can't do much about them or need to cop, keep working on. You will see blind spots in what I offer today. And I just ask you to be kind and I urge you to adapt whatever it is I offer into an application that works in your setting. So, but my twin aims today are really one, to provide you some very practical tools to engage with military members, veterans, and family members. And then secondly, to urge you to kind of expand your thinking. And you've gotten some good tips already, even in terms of what to add to your vocabulary of questions. So three topics. The first one, I wanted to give just a couple of slides by way of vision. This is the vision statement that's kind of emerged over about six months of conversation and planning to get us to this event. And I wanna underscore, and I have the word sustain. This is not envisioned as a one-off event. Our hope is that there'll be a years long sustained engagement among faith leaders to address military members, veterans and their families for collaboration, for information sharing and encouragement. We realize the planners of this, caring for this, these populations is not the centerpiece of your ministry. But as John Fleming said, maybe nine out of 10 people you meet are not military or veterans, but that one in 10, it will make a big difference if you are culturally competent and have some practical tools that might address their given situation. How do we get to this vision? Uh, it started with some breakfast table talk and kind of expanded to there. But the, the hope to get to this day actually began in June with an online uh, survey monkey that was sent around to community clergy for which we had email addresses. And we wanted to listen and learn. And we used the feedback from the online survey that we did to identify some key topics. And these were the top tier, the top three. How do veterans access their benefits? How do we assist homeless or people that are at risk for becoming unhoused who may get some help from the VA or other community resources and the suicide prevention and awareness? There's some other categories that were identified. And I, I'll take this moment to just draw attention to those of you in the room. These go bags, these red and black Department of VA go bags have additional materials that address some of the related topics. I'll just mention one. Uh, the Jacksonville National Cemetery is on the north side of town. It's run by the National Cemetery Administration, part of the Department of Veterans Affairs. People can be buried, 
have a head, headstone or a grave marker and a spouse or family member buried with them as a part of their VA benefits. There's material in there about uh, burial honors and about access to the cemetery. Uh, we're not going to address that today, but it's just a sample of what's in there. There's other material in there about the vet centers, which do some counseling and additional materials and some nice gifts from the Cohen Center, from the Firewatch and other organizations as well. Uh, so that's the vision, that's the background. But our aim is this sustained engagement. So every, I don't know, maybe once a year or twice a year, we're hoping to pick up this conversation and there will be some additional resources that general funding will talk about. So this is the main heart of my presentation, the second topic, assisting individuals and families. And I wanna to, uh, touch on a couple of key elements of this. Acronyms, VSO, Veteran Service Organization. You know, you're a part of a tremendous ecosystem of support for military members, veterans, and their families. And it's often invisible, but I believe that there's probably more capacity in this Jacksonville metropolitan community than in many other communities around the country. Uh, so I want to introduce you to the, the framework of volunteer service organizations, disabled veterans, for example, or American Legion or AMVETS. There's uh, Canines for Warriors. We've got the sponsoring organizations for this event and more. Secondly, the city of Jacksonville has a military department and uh, military affairs and veterans department. And that's really a gateway, not only for city resources, but to connect you to the state resources because there's a state department of veterans affairs and the federal resources through the department of VA. For most of the kinds of questions that might come your way, I wanna underscore the role of the city office, military affairs, and uh, Veterans Department. They have staff that can help veterans and their families navigate the wide range of resources and benefits that are there. Another tool for your use, and General Fleming has alluded to this and I put it on the site, you'll get this in the slide deck that comes your way. These are two resources available to you online. One is called the Faith Leader Resource Guide. Now this is a curated list that's been compiled and refreshed this week in order to get us ready for this event. And this is focused on faith-oriented resources that can be useful to you in a variety of ministry settings, whether it's uh, planning for congregational events, whether it's working with youth and families. Uh, it's a long but carefully curated up-to-date list. These are live links. You don't click on it and get, sorry, this is no longer working. This is stuff that's being uh, kept up to date. There's a larger veterans resource guide that's aimed for the general population, but there's a specific faith resource guide for you. Uh, you've seen this slide from uh, Mr. Pridgen from the VA. And often when people use the term VA, they're thinking of some enormous organization. And just this basic org chart gives you a glimpse. There's benefits. And when people think about that, that's a home loan, that's GI Bill, uh, that's a disability benefit, you know, if somebody's been wounded or injured or uh, gotten ill on active duty and get a benefit. There's the healthcare organization, uh, which Mr. Pridgen represented, in which you saw the map, you saw the extensive network we have here in North Florida, South Georgia, and the cemetery administration, which I just mentioned. <laughs> so under Benefits, this is just a laundry list of some of what's available. Uh, and many of these involve financial support to veterans. Others involve specialized programs that can help veterans. Um, and again, the key point is the last uh, bullet on the screen there, which is the City of Jacksonville Military and Veterans Affairs Department. That organization has staff that can help individuals navigate. There's the phone number. You'll have it more than once. It'll be in the slide deck when you get it. That second category in the VA is health administration. If, if you have a veteran who hasn't yet registered with the VA for healthcare, uh, I urge you to follow General's advice. Suggest that they register. You'll see on the VA table in the back, this yellow form. For those who prefer to operate online, 
a veteran can fill out this one page front and back form to register to be considered for VA healthcare. Uh, you don't need to be an expert, but if you ask the question and get them <clears throat> online to the 1010EZ, uh, gives them a chance to register for healthcare with the VA. If you need help, I recommend you go to the city of Jacksonville. They have a whole office there dedicated to help individual veterans and their families. Uh, you've seen this map. Uh, as Mr. Pritchard, uh, Pritchard said, you know, Florida is and South Georgia is the most heavily concentrated area for veterans in the country out of all the, the 20 plus visits or veterans integrated, integrated service networks. Uh, so this is a place where your ministry is going to impact veterans here in this part of the country more than many other places. And you see the range of two VA medical centers, which are full upstanding hospitals, you know, just like you would see, you know, at Shands or other places in Lake City and Gainesville. Uh, the large clinics, which are shown uh, with the diamonds in the villages, Tallahassee and here in Jacksonville, and then some community-based clinics. Other healthcare services, this is a laundry list and it's partial. Uh, so whatever the presenting concern might be, there is often help available. This is the most important slide. You've got a copy of this in your bag. I've got additional ones uh, if you need them. This is a VA single point of access. If you don't do anything else with a veteran and they have a question, this is a conversation that you can have sometimes with a speakerphone in your office. This is a live human being on the other end of this phone. I called it last month just to make sure somebody answered the phone, the number still worked. And yes, they can address this wide range of topics, whether it involves benefits, healthcare, cemetery support, or some of these other specific concerns, suicide prevention, homelessness, uh, financial assistance, and more. Uh, I've got one of those in your go bag. I've got additional ones. I recommend you put this on a bulletin board. Some of that passive in engagement with veterans is the most effective. So a veteran could call on his or her own. Uh, you could do it by speakerphone in your office. Or if you're sitting with a family member and they're talking about their loved one who's deceased and they're doing funeral planning and you need some help on funeral planning, access to the VA cemetery, burial honors, this is a single point of contact. I want to mention the city of Jacksonville, Military Affairs and Veterans Department. They're a very effective organization for helping integrate, open doors, uh, and support veterans and family members. The two images I use with them, air traffic control or port operations. I mean, I think they are the traffic cop of how to navigate what resources might be most useful. I would say their main program areas from listening to Mr. Harrison Connors and Ms. Tiffany Morales are the ones I've listed. Referrals for homelessness and job opportunities. They're integrated with volunteer service organizations and other uh, uh, nonprofit organizations here in our community to support men, women, and families in transition or in at risk of homelessness. They work on job opportunities. I suggest that you contact Tiffany Morales and ask her to add you to what they call the email blast. Every Thursday, there's an email that comes out. It gives you a, just a laundry list of upcoming or current events uh, that relate to supporting military members, veterans, and their families. It's a great way to stay connected and communicating uh, across different organizations. And they really take pride in the way that they help veterans with the application for benefits, and appeals, because not every veteran that applies initially gets approved, and it involves an appeals process. That second phase is often much equally important as even doing the initial application, and they have experts to help with the application and appeals. I did mention the State Department, and I've given you a couple of contacts there, one in Tallahassee, both their telephone number and the website. And this is just one of several state employees that work here in Jacksonville, but Glenn Newbins works at one of our VA clinics on University Boulevard. That's Glenn's phone number. You call Glenn and say, I need some help with state benefits. He will uh, either get you where you need to go uh, or provide the assistance directly. 
Now I want to shift into some practical tools and a kind of a uh, uh, collage of possible uh, tools that might be useful to you. And I like this slide because it highlights three different facets of that ecosystem I mentioned. There's another acronym for you, CRRC, Community Resource and Referral Center. That's a federal department of Veterans Affairs activity, the Community Resource and Referral Center. I've got a one page front and back flyer in your go bag with the Community Resource Center information. It's the list of some of the people that work there and their contact information. This is a key resource for you if you're trying to aid somebody who's come to you seeking help because they're at risk or currently homeless. The city of Jacksonville does specialized work in this area. They have a structured program to get people into transitional housing and it's connected to employment possibilities. Third, I like this last bullet because it demonstrates a connection between uh, a faith community and a volunteer or a veteran service organization. The Northeast Florida Women's Veteran Organization operates her space, which is a transition housing place for women veterans. It's operated out of a house in Jacksonville Beach, which is being provided by a congregation. They've taken their parish house, offered it to this veteran service organization and said, if you can help women veterans, use our house. And they have a program staffing on site through the Northeast Florida Women's Veterans Organization, assisting women veterans. Uh, so this is a beautiful collaboration between a faith organization, St. Andrews Lutheran uh, by the Sea, and uh, Northeast Florida Women's Veterans. That was homeless. Let's talk about suicide. Nick Howland and the Firewatch, uh, that network that's covering five counties is soon to expand to cover the entire state of Florida through their competence and uh, amazing success. Uh, he talked about their basic training. Uh, he talked about safe place. I'd love as we go forward to be able to visit places of worship and see that sticker on synagogues, mosques, and churches all across this community. So veterans walk up to the front door and say, maybe they can help. The other thing that Nick didn't mention, but I want to underscore is you may be interested in an adult forum that would touch on this topic of suicide prevention, awareness and prevention. And I think it's relevant not only for veterans and military members. I mean, suicide awareness and prevention is applicable to all dimensions of our society. And, you know, there have been examples over the years of uh, what are sometimes called copycat suicides, where there's a high school student who ends her or his life. And then, you know, through this painful experience, there are others that imitate that same behavior. Um, Nick and the Firewatch are willing to come to your faith community and do some, you know, face-to-face, in-person engagement about suicide awareness and prevention. So as it says, I think it generalizes beyond our military and veterans communities. That's suicide. Let's turn to mental health and trauma. There was a couple of references along the way to PTSD. That gets a lot of visibility in the culture. Uh, as General Fleming has emphasized, the vast majority of returning veterans, including returning combat veterans, uh, they may have traumatic memories, but they're not diagnosable with a post-traumatic stress disorder, which is debilitating. There's a spectrum, of course. Um, for those who can benefit from additional emotional, relational, spiritual support, uh, there's medical care available, uh, and the VA has an extensive mental health program uh, that's accessible for those veterans that are registered and then get enrolled in healthcare. Uh, for those who are not registered but may need help, there's a program called the Vet Centers, which are not directly connected to the healthcare system. In your go bag, you'll see a flyer for the Vet Centers. These are walk in clinics and then scheduled appointments with competent mental health providers that can serve combat veterans who may need help with emotions, relationships, uh, meaning making in their lives. And I wanna underscore the chaplaincy ministry of some of the experts that we have on the chaplain team here in North Florida, South Georgia. You met Chaplain 
Melvin Lane. He's our chief chaplain, covers those two medical centers and all the clinics. Uh, he's, we've got a staff, there's a team of us, and a couple of them are specialists. Uh, I wanna just introduce you to Chaplain Ruben Crespo. Chaplain Crespo runs these four groups. He does some of these in person, most of these online as well. And these are examples of integrating spirituality with mental health care. Uh, he teaches a course, it's called Trauma Reboot. It's intended to help people navigate traumatic memories or experiences with skills for coping. And it's spiritually integrated. Uh, there's a therapy group. They have inpatient and outpatient services that Ruben's a part of. He has a building spiritual strength program. So it's focused on resiliency. He does a journaling and meditation. Chaplain Crespo, there's his phone number. You'll get this in your slide deck. Uh, this is Chaplain Terry Gast. She runs three different groups, another spirituality group. She does what's called a post-traumatic growth, moral injury reconciliation process, which is a structured sequence program on healing. And then working with aging veterans, she does a program focusing on navigating aging. Chaplain Terry Gast. That's what I've covered. I wanted to get you acquainted with veteran service organizations. I wanted to link you in your mind with the ecosystem around us, with the city, the state, and the federal resources, and go over that list of practical tools for your use. The last and final section I wanted to cover here has to do with your role as a congregational and community leader. Now, this is where my blind spot comes in, but I hope you can be kind and adapt. Uh, my own denomination, uh, in advance of this year's Veterans Day weekend, put together a four-page uh, resource tool for worship planners. Many congregations will do a specialized prayer, have a time of blessing or acknowledgement for veterans during a worship service. Sometimes they'll have the veterans stand. And if you want to add to that, you could say, well, if you're a veteran, please stand. And if you're a family member of a veteran, please stand. Or if you're a surviving family member of someone who served and died, please say, I mean, suddenly you realize half the congregation is standing. So it involves the veteran, but I think you can also consider expanding that. And I thought I would uh, just give you this sample of one of the prayers that was included in this uh, worship resource kit that my own denomination put together. Almighty and ever-living God, we give you thanks for the men and women who have served and defended our country and the values of freedom and justice we hold so dear. Help us be mindful of the sacrifices they made and the hardships endured by their families and friends so that we never take for granted the privileges they have secured for us. In your mercy, hear us, we pray. An intercessory prayer. On the VA table that's in the back, I've got a little additional bag that's intended to be used as a gift for veterans. Mm. And in that bag, I've got some lapel pins. Uh, one is specifically for veterans. It's identified, I am a veteran. Uh, and I'd like you to consider taking some of those for veterans in your faith community. There's also some additional lapel pins that are just an American flag. I think there might be some creative ways you can use these on a Memorial Day or on a Veterans Day in your own faith community. It's a gift to acknowledge the veteran. You can kind of ritualize this. So whether you bring them forward to the chancel rail, whether you have them stand in place, whether you gather in a prayer huddle, however your worship form takes, uh, you can use this as an additional resource. And I also wanted to just underscore your role as a congregational leader and some additional programmatic steps. Sometimes we think of our role as helping veterans. I also want to flip the script. There are plenty of veterans and military members who show up in a congregation whose mindset is, how can I help? How can I help? Where can you use me? And I think when I look around and see congregations that do a Thanksgiving outreach ministry, largely driven by their veteran uh, members in their faith community, or doing a Christmas gift drive, you know, or a gift giving drive of some sort, Veterans and military members and their families also make a big contribution to our faith communities. Uh, many congregations in the community here do a specialized meal around Veterans Day. 
Uh, you know, I, I know of one congregation that has well over 100 veterans that attend uh, the Veterans Day weekend meal that they do on a Friday night before, you know, closest to Veterans Day. Uh, and it's a time of celebration and music and joy. There was a congregation out in, uh, near Denver, Colorado that I'm well aware of. I mean, they bring in 400 participants to their annual Veterans Day gathering uh, for a meal on the weekend. And I want to think about adult forums. And I know I've already mentioned the Firewatch being willing to come out and do an adult program, but I know these VSOs would also be very interested and willing. So if you're looking for a way to kind of gently introduce this to your adult membership in the congregation, think about that ecosystem and the potential partners you have. And I want to end by saying thank you for your service. Your leadership makes a difference. I mean, the analogy General uh, Fleming used was you're on the front lines. I, I think of you as really the, the, the voices and, faith and faces of the faith community connecting to this population. So thank you for what you're doing. I, I'm so grateful you're here. As I said, our vision is a sustained engagement. So I hope to see you again here sometime in 2022. And I look forward to continuing to collaborate and work together. Thank you. Thank you, Chaplain Wester. That was fantastic. Uh, question wasn't able to attend. Is the go bag resource available for pickup from the center uh, later? Absolutely. Uh, we will have some of the, uh, those of you who live in Jacksonville, we'll have the, um, we'll have go bags here to pick up. And then plus we'll be sending you everything electronically like the uh, things that the chaplain was talking about uh, to you. So the resources, uh, this is, I won't go in depth on this. These are the four organizations that are sponsoring, but uh, here are uh, some of the uh, other uh, types of uh, things. And I'll, I'm gonna show you the, those top three. I'm gonna show you all three of those so you see them. And then also uh, we have uh, uh, Evangel Temple Veterans Ministry, uh, Mo Bajani, who works at uh, actually UF Health. He's an army veteran. They have a dynamic program. So you can look and they, they have some suggestions for you. And then down here, you have some of the information about uh, people who have the um, uh, points of contact and we'll be sending you all that. I'm gonna stop sharing the slide for a second and I'm gonna share with you the, uh, the resource pages uh, that we have developed uh, for you. Find them. Okay, hold on just a second. Why isn't that showing up? Okay, now I'm going to go back and share my screen. Okay, here we go. So we have a couple of things here uh, for you. Uh, one is that uh, the firewatch.org is the basic you get here, but you have here, this is the resource guide. This is the one that has uh, about 430 different resources here. And so you can just go on there and I'll just click on uh, military family, for example. You can go here and it's got a listing of the, uh, the different resources here for all kinds of different categories. Uh, let's just take healthcare. I'll just click on that very quickly. And it's got VA facilities, military, and different kinds. So, so that is the broader one that it's got for in all veterans and military families. Now, what you also have is the, uh, here, it's the faith leader. So you have within Firewatch, you'll go on Firewatch here, and you'll see here, you can click on this. It's got the guide, which is where we just were, and the faith leader resources. This is developed specifically for you as faith leaders. And it's got, uh, it, we will put the webinar here. And then on the left-hand side, down here, those are the, uh, we'll make sure my face is not on there. We'll so <laughs> just make sure. We'll, we'll take that as a best practice to not have my face there. Uh, but it's got, those are the different uh, ministry resources for you. And one of them I'd like to, to, to show you real quick. It's a Military 101 reference guide. And what the reference guide does is a lot of the things that we have been talking about here, it's got it all in one place. Because that's one of the things that uh, I think uh, we want to be able to do is we've given you a ton of information here. And what do I do with it? Well, 
what you can do here is you see this and you see all the different things here about the uh, 101 guide. And it's got information about the military structure. It's got all different things that we had just finished talking about. Both of them are very much modeled on each other and listing here. Now we have to, I have to update this. This is, needs to have Space Force on there. And so um, that's, what, that's why it is a, uh, let me see if I can get this stupid thing to work better. Okay. Why is this paused? Okay. Oops. Let me just go there to make sure everybody's having it. But that's that's the military. That is the uh, military resource guide for you. You can go through the faith leader uh, resource page uh, for that. So we've uh, we've been very fortunate here with the uh, to to take you through everything. And let me take you now. Not start at the beginning because you've <laughs> you've seen you've seen quite enough of, of that, but. Uh, I'll, I'll start with, I'll leave with these last two, but this have uh, people that you can talk to. It's very important. We feel like you have the ability to, to talk to different people about, the, um, about what you've learned today. And then also, let me leave you with this. And um, if I could talk about the, uh, the challenges here, and really what I'd like to do, and I'll open it up for questions here, is thank you so much for caring enough to go through this. And so now that I said, thank you for your service here. I'm gonna make a challenge to you. You see the top one, use the information to ed educate, not just yourself, but to permeate it in your staff. Because each one of them is gonna be reaching out in a particular way. Maybe you have an elderly uh, ministry. You're gonna have veterans in that. You're certainly gonna have kids in Jacksonville in Northeast Florida, really across the United States who are military kids give it to your youth pastor and then take it to other members within your faith. What we'd love for you to do is tell us that, you know, we'd like one of, you'd like one of us to come talk to your uh, presbytery or your conference or something like that. You know, in each one of the dom denominations, normally you're affiliated work across Northeast Florida. We'd love to go talk to them about it, to get a bigger group to do what we've done. And we can do it in an hour. We do it in 15 minutes, whatever you, but is to get that. We would like you, and the last one is, become advocates for this training. Because hopefully you've seen things here, you've, you've, you've learned things that are gonna be helpful for you. And then you see that we've created resources for you, you can use on an ongoing basis. But the only way this is gonna be effective is that we can go broader. We can get as many different individuals within the faith community uh, to be advocates and to understand. So this is, uh, you know, this is what we've, uh, we've, we've gone through and would love to uh, answer any uh, questions either in the chat or here in uh, uh, Jacksonville before we uh, close in prayer. Anything? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the video that has the 15 Yes, ma'am. Is that being sent to us? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. The, the question is, uh, was the Psych Armor video, 15 Things Veterans Want You to Know, being sent to you? Yes, it'll be in both embedded in the, uh, in the whole presentation, but it also will be provided to you separately if you want to use that. Because, you know, you can use that very quickly. It's about 15 minutes long, and it really can do that. And then you can lead into that to some of the other resources. So, absolutely. Okay. Thank you for the, the well presented. So uh, in summary, uh, we appreciate the fact that you took the time to do this training. Uh, we will be sending some to the participants. If you've got uh, other individuals that you think would like to be on this distribution, just share their emails with us. But also we would really love for you to, be, to share with us other organizations or other friends of yours who you think would be benefit from the training within the faith community. And the beauty of Zoom is it doesn't matter where you are around the world. If you've got someone who would, uh, our organization, or if you would like us to come out to talk to your men's club, your women's club or uh, club or your groups, we'd love to do that. So thank you very much for everything. Let me uh, ask uh, King Counts, who is in our uh, Nashville or Clarksville office. King, could you close us in prayer, please? Join our hearts together in prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you have always been there for us uh, through times of plenty and times of want. We thank you that you have blessed our country with freedom and liberty. We are grateful for uh, our veterans, our active duty and reserve forces. We pray your protection and your um, care over them and their families. Thank you for the faith leaders, Lord, that uh, point us to the need to to trust uh, in a God who looks over all of what we do, and we need your help. We pray that uh, what has been uh, shared today, this valuable and practical information, will actually uh, be used in action steps uh, to support the people who have given so much uh, of their selves uh, to defend our liberties and to, uh, to be there for us in times of uh, adversity. So we ask you to uh, to bless each one that's been part of this. We ask you to watch over us, and we ask you to continue to bless this great nation. We ask in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, King. And the other thing I would add is we're going to send you a survey so we can continually improve this. So thank you so much to each one of you for being such a great uh, audience and the feedback. And uh, please become advocates for us. Help us spread the word about the military experience so we can serve those who served us. Thank you. Have a great day.